your iPhone or your iPad, which you may be like. Thank you, Jesus. springboard from begin to talk about the Lord this morning. Yes, yes. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was a spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was mindful to put her away privately. But while he thought on those these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee unto Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now all this was, he, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took her unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Someone say Jesus. Turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 1. See my mode up here, so. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Take my time this morning, because I want to say what the Lord would have me to say. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Is everyone there? You can let them come on in. If anybody's at the door, let them come on in because we want to be on one accord here. Yeah. We have a little bit of reading to do this morning. Luke chapter 1, um, verse 5. It was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in the years. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of the people were praying without the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit of power and of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers and the children, and the disobedient to the, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared uh, for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. The angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 26. Moving. All 
right to read the word sometimes. Amen. Amen. It's good to get in there and see what the word says. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God, the city of Galilee, unto Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in to her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth hour with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to that word. And the angel departed from her. The Lord gave me a title this morning, The Power of the Divine Word of God. The Power of the Divine Word of God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. We thank you this morning for this opportunity to share your word. Give us understanding. Speak to our hearts and minds that we might understand clearly the principles that you're trying to articulate into our lives. Even now, we rebuke the enemy that would try to hinder the word of God. I find every sleepy spirit. I uh, lose the power of God that makes teaching easy. I thank you right now for increase in our life. Glorify you and magnify you. In Jesus' name. A lot of stories here. Just a couple things going on. That's why I'm calling people up here because I need something, something to happen. Right now. Sorry about that. The devil's always busy. But God is busy too. so much meaning uh, in my life, the power of the divine word of God. I think one of the hardest principles uh, to understand for me is a word called predestination. That's God's predetermination to accomplish his will in people's lives. And as we looked at these stories, uh, that's what these stories are about. They're about the will of God being accomplished and God sending his word to let people know this is what I'm going to do. It is a principle, that, a principle that we see throughout not only just the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, but it's a principle that we must embrace in our walk with God so that we can walk by faith. Because quite often we have a tendency uh, to walk by sight. Because there's so much always seem to be going on that we can lose sight of what God has said to us. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 20. I'm going to be teaching this morning, so this is a, a good day to take notes. I won't preach in the end, but I want to teach first. Because I want us to really get this principle. It's a powerful principle. It has blessed my life. It's a principle and a clear understanding of predestination. It does not mean that God makes you be saved. It means something more than that, something greater than that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we see a scripture that many times is understood only on the surface. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29 goes on and says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. 
that he might be the firstborn among brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? God before us, he said, who can be against us? Many times we hear people quote verse 28 when they get in trouble, or something goes wrong, and they'll say, well, you know, all things work together for good to them that love God. Technically, they're right, but principally, they're wrong. Because it's not working together for good for you. And quite often we will take a text like this and we will use it as an excuse for when we don't do what God tells us to do. And then we'll bounce back and say, well, you know, all things work together for good. And then you're just going through struggles and saying all things work together for good. But the scripture is not really talking about you. The scripture is talking about what God is trying to accomplish in you. And when you look at verse 29, what God is trying to accomplish is that God is trying to transform you into his image. So the whole portion of the text is talking about how God has predetermined before the beginning of time that he was going to transform you into the image of his son. So when you go through struggles and hard times, it's working out for the good of the purpose of God. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross, gee, God looked down from heaven and said it pleased God to bruise him. And I'm sure when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was not saying, this is working out for the good. Because it wasn't feeling good. But it was working out for the good because it was fulfilling the purpose of God. Can you say amen? amen. I had to really come to grip with understanding why God allowed me to get caught up on drugs. And part of it was because my dreams did not line up with the vision of God. When I was 20 years old, my dreams were to be a millionaire. And by the time I was 22, I was well on the road to accomplishing the task. I owned three retail record stores, one of the largest record stores in California. And I was making over a half a million dollars a year. I bought my first house at 22 and was working on buying my second condo at 23. And my dreams were big. I had over 13 employees that were under me that I hired. And I didn't really have to work. I just kind of came in and out and went and bought product and went to parties and threw concerts and did all those kind of things all through my 20s. And I had big dreams. But while I was dreaming to be a millionaire, God saw the show of faith in Mesa, Arizona. Yes, yes. And somewhere along the line, through the parties, and the drinking and the drugs, I wound up getting hooked on cocaine. By the time I was 27, 28 years old, I had a habit. By the time I was 29 and 30, I was a bum on the street. I had literally sold my record business for $16,000 worth of cocaine rock. At that time, I could not say all things work together for good. Because one, I didn't even know that scripture. But yet, in the mind of God, it was working together for good to them that are the cause. I'm going to say I'm called. You have to understand that you are called before you know you're called. Because the Bible says before the foundation of the world that the Lord had predestined the coin. Yes. And so while I got called on drugs, God saw me laying hands on the sick. Yes. What am I saying? I'm saying that we spend so much time looking at the here and now that we don't really understand what God sees in the future. The Bible tells us that God sees the beginning from the end. That he is the Alpha and the Omega. And when God says let there be light and he began to create, in his mind he had already created everything. He had already saw the end result. He had already saw you getting saved. He had already saw you going down in the watery veins of baptism. He already saw your cousin getting saved. He already saw your brother getting saved. He already saw the things you did wrong. When you walk around trying to have false humility, God says, 
stop it. Already knew you were going to do it before you did it. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. He says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Many times I, I'm wondering, what is God thinking about me? With all of my frailties and all of my shortcomings and falling short of God and not doing everything that God has called me to do at all times, I, I wonder if God sometimes gets frustrated with me or I wonder if God looks at me and says, man, I'm getting tired of you making the same mistakes over and over again. But I believe that that's not how God views us. I believe that when God looks at me and he looks at you and he says, I know the thoughts, I think, I think he's thinking about the end result. The way God thinks about us is totally different than the way we think about ourselves. Because we'll think, man, I'm broke today. And the Lord says, man, this rich is down the road. We'll think, man, I'm feeling sick. And the Lord said, there's healing in my wings. We'll think, man, these things are not going to work out. And God already sees the victory on the other side. So I've learned and a very important principle. And that important principle is that I have to stop fooling around with my own mind. Yeah. Uh, catch this. So bless you if you catch it. Yes, sir. Because some of us, we think too much about ourselves. Yes. And some of us think too highly of ourselves. Yes. And some of us think too little of ourselves. Yes. But the real issue is we need to stop thinking about ourselves. Yeah. We need to think about what God is thinking about. The importance of having the mind of Christ. Because what God thinks is really all that matters. Why, why would I even care about what God thinks? Because if I can see what Jesus sees, whew, then I can really have faith. Sometimes we, we, we have faith in the struggle. We're struggling with problems and we're struggling with issues and we're like, oh Lord, I don't even know why I'm in this. And the Lord says, I know you don't know because you don't see what I see. You, you don't see how the struggle, how the problem is going to bring you to the point where I need you to be so I can change you and transform you into the image of Christ. After I had reached the place of doing $700 a day in cocaine every day, Hustle, still breaking in cars, swindling people. Then I ran into a young man that told me about Jesus. If I had never gotten down that far, if God had allowed me to be a millionaire, I would have been flying all over the world when they never missed Jesus. I would have missed Jesus. But because of my condition, God let me get to a place where man couldn't help me. God, God let me get so far down that even my own family didn't want to have anything to do with me. People just, they shunned me. They didn't invite me to Thanksgiving. I couldn't come over for Christmas. I was dirty and stinky and smelly and no one wanted to have anything to do with me. But the Lord had a young man that came and talked to me about Jesus. I was so arrogant in my depression that when he told me about God, I said, God can't help me. God might be able to help somebody else, but listen, God can't help me. He said, listen, you don't even know God. You don't even know the power of the Holy Ghost. I said, listen, I might not know God, but I know how bad I am. I know how low I am. I know the condition I'm in. But through his persuasive power, he convinced me to go to church. I remember sitting in service. Service just like this one. People praising the Lord and shouting. Lifting their hands and running. Sitting in the sick row right there where I stood. I'm looking around. You know how you get to look at you. You're looking because you don't know what's going on. You're like, whoo. <laughs> Folks have been doing stuff you ain't never seen before. People get to dancing. People are like, what kind of dance is that? But when the altar call came, and he says, who wants the Holy Ghost? 
The gentleman that brought me to church looked at me and said, he's talking to you. I didn't know about the Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Ghost? And I went down to the altar and I lift my hands and they said, Hall say hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes. Come on, say it more than one time. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, you got to say it more than twice. Yes. Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. And I spoke in tongues for 20 minutes. Yes. I fell on the ground. Spit and snot me. Sorry. And when I got up off the ground, everybody was gone. Yes. Church was lit out. And I got up with a smile on my face, so big. And God delivered me instantly from the power of Satan. And from that day forward, I began to understand that the divine word of God has power. When God sends a word about what he's going to do, nobody can stop it. When we look at these stories, we see this, this major principle taking place. We see God telling Joseph and giving him insight to the future. In Matthew chapter 1, he, he, he tells him, if, you, if, you got, if you're there, go there for me, with me for a second. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he tells him, you're going to have a son. Yes. And you're going to call his name Jesus. And this is what he's going to do. He's going to save people from I don't know what was Joseph's mind at that point. I, I, don't, I don't know how he was able to embrace the complete concept of his wife having a child, not by him. Thank you, Jesus. And being able to accept it and recognizing that this was really an angel and not a demon. The angel said, I'm Gabriel. And your wife is pregnant. Say the Lord will be shit. <laughs> but he embraced what was spoken. And he believed the angel. And he believed God's word. And when the child was born, he called him Jesus. We look at Luke chapter 1, verse 13. The Lord gives Zacharias insight to the future. He says, listen, you're going to have a son. He's going to have the Holy Ghost at birth. In verse 16, he's going to bring many people and turn them to the Lord. He's going to go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said, I can't hardly believe this is too much. How do you know this? Because I came from the Lord and I have a divine word from God and God said to tell you. And since you don't believe it, you're not going to even be able to talk until the baby's born. And if you know the story, he was mum, couldn't speak until the baby was born. And they told him you're going to call the baby John. And they kept asking him when the baby's born. What's the baby's name? What's the baby's name? And come on and say something. We're going to call him Zacharias. And oh, his name is John. You ain't getting me in trouble. <laughs> See the Lord talking to Mary. Same angel shows up. Well, let's try it again. Mary, you're going to have a baby. She's like, okay, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. But I haven't done that yet. Don't worry about it. Holy Ghost going to give you a baby. Oh. Walking. 
looking by faith and all that they can. And the angel shows up and says, listen, God's getting ready to do something supernatural in your life. I wonder how many times God has spoken to you and said that he's going to do something supernatural in your life. And what has been your response? Oh. According to thy will, O Lord. According to thy will. Be it unto me. In verse 38. My response is, I don't quite understand what you're going to do. How are you going to do it? Which way is going to work? But whatever you say, Lord, I'm in. This morning, God said that the problem with the saints is that we're not embracing this principle that if God says it, that settles it. We have not come to a place where we really understand the role of God in our walk by faith. We believe God for things and stuff, but we don't believe Him for His Word. We try to believe for the things that we want, but when God tells us something that's contrary to our dreams and our desires, then all of a sudden we don't believe it and don't accept it. But God said, listen, you can't stop me. Sometimes we toss and turn at night and we're struggling in our walk and we can't figure it out. God says to let you know this morning, the reason why you're tossing and turning and struggling is because I'm working on you. Yes, yes. The idea that God's going to transform you into the image of the Son is not a light idea. Nope. The things that God's going to take you through to make you look like Him. Wow. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's working on you. Look at the person on the other side. He's working on me. He's going to keep Working on you, molding you, twisting you, bending you, stretching you, pressuring you, raising you, pressing you down, turning you around, sitting you down, standing you up, raising you up, pushing you forward, pulling you backwards, leading you to the right, pulling you to the left, until you look just like Jesus.
the scripture that God gives me that keeps me on point. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and bringeth it forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish. Someone say it shall accomplish. Yeah. Come on, someone say it shall accomplish. Yeah. It shall accomplish that which I please, yeah. and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Yeah. Amen. God says, you got to stop looking at circumstance. I would get so frustrated. We would have 10 men and then we would have three. Then we would have 15 men, men and we have five. Then we have 35 men, then we have 12. Then we have 22 men, then we have six. I'm like, Lord, you said 300. God says, my word shall not return void. It shall accomplish that which I said it shall accomplish. The problem is you on the wrong timeline. You're trying to do it when you want to do it. But when I get good and ready, of being ready to be ready to be saved. But the Lord is going to save them because God says in his word and his word says I'm going to deliver and I'm going to bring 300 men in this place and they're going to love me. They're going to be warriors. They're going to be fighters. They're going to stand for righteousness. I don't care how hard the task is. God said he's going to do it. And when I get discouraged, yes, go to the Word. Yes. I have it highlighted. Yeah. I have it circled. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the next time I have to go to it, I'll underline it. Yes. So each time I have to go back, I do something different to it as a reminder that God said. Yes. You have to ask yourself, what is God saying to you? What is God doing in you? How is God fixing you? What direction is God moving you? What what vision has God shown you? If you have not heard the voice of God, if you have not seen the vision of God, then you need to get on your knees and you need to pray. God, speak to me. And when God speaks, nobody can stop. I don't care what the devil says. Oh, you're not going to make it. Things are just going to get so hard. The Lord said. Yes. Oh, I've been sick for a long time. My body's up. But the Lord said. Yes. He that has begun a good work in you. The Lord don't save you to do a bad work. It's not, it's not about how you feel about yourself or how people look at you. What is the work that God is doing? Each and every one of us that have been saved for any period of time can look back and see the changes that God has made. Changes in our mind, the way we think, changes in our attitude, the way we respond, changes in our, in our walk and the power and the relationship that we have with God. It's been a process, step by step, slowly we turn. The Lord has just been working and working. And God says, I'm going to keep working on you. looking right in the eye tell them you're a good work you, you're a good work you know sometimes you know you do some things and then the devil he, he swoops in try, trying to make you feel condemned trying to put you down you have to look at the devil and say listen I'm a good work when you're making something it looks ugly when you first start on it It doesn't matter what it is you're working on. Whether it's woodwork or it's pottery, even when we do flooring. You come in the house when we first start. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Tile all broken up, dust everywhere. We try to get the owner don't come in because, you know, you start looking at all the stuff, you think we're tearing up something. 
Because we really are. We're like tearing up. Sometimes when God's working on you, look at your life. It looks like stuff is just being torn up and falling apart and nothing's working. And Jesus, listen, I'm working on you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. You got somebody here and I'm a good work. I don't care what you think about me, I'm a good work. <laughs> Why is God doing that? Because God has sent his word years ago. We are so often caught up in thinking that the word is about us. When really the word is about God. And what he has been predetermined to do with us. Romans chapter 9 verse 22. We're going to be closing with this. Paul begins to teach about the sovereignty of God. It is a principle that goes hand in hand with the divine word of God. The whole name it and claim it teaching is false because you don't have that kind of power. If I can speak a thing and make it so, that's just good Christian preaching. But it's not biblically sound. You cannot speak a thing into existence because you have no creative power. And the only person that has creative power is God. So if God says it, then you can re-speak what God says because God's going to make it happen. But you can't make up something. Tree be right there. Ain't no tree showing up. But if God says, tomorrow a tree's going to be right there. Then you can stand up and say, the Lord said that under the concrete, there's been a tree laying dormant. And if the Lord says And so Paul begins to talk to the Roman church about the sovereignty of God. In Romans chapter 9, verse 22. And he says, if God be willing to show his wrath, to make his power known and do with what's long suffering the vessels of wrath put into destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he has afore prepared unto glory even us whom he has called not of the Jews only but also the Gentiles as he saith also in Osea, Osea I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not my beloved and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Yes. Say as also cried concerning Israel, for the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Yes. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath has left us to see, we have been as solemn and be like a more. And what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which follow after the law of righteousness, has not attained unto the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. What is he saying? He said, listen, I'm sovereign. I know you thought only the Jews was going to be saved. But you have to remember what I said way back in Hosea. Chapter 2, verse 23. You have to remember what I told Hosea, that there's going to be a people that's not my people. And I told everybody, you guys are my favorite. You're the apple of my eye. But screw Hold up. Because now, the people that I said are not my people. I'm going to make them my people. And there's really nothing you can do about it. You can be mad, you can stick your lips out, you can turn up your, 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 your eyes, you can roll your eyes. He says, listen, I made a determination a long time ago that I was going to save the Gentile. And I'm going to transform them into the image of myself. And I'm going to work on them and work on them until it's time for me to come back. So you can get mad, you can get angry, you can be upset, but the bums on the street, God's going to bring them in to be saved. The alcoholic on the street, God's going to bring them to be saved. The drug addict on the street, God's going to bring them in to be saved. Because God has already determined before the foundation of the world that he predestined people 
will be transformed into the image of the sin of your son. And I am a witness. You are a witness. Let me tell you, I'm going to come down your street. We get saved. And we're all happy. We're praising the Lord. And we buy new clothes. And we're blessed with new cars and new houses. And then we see our relatives who are still bound in drugs. Still caught up in gambling. Still living with their boyfriend and girlfriend. And we begin to look down at them as if somehow God can't save them. Not understanding that at the appointed time, when God decides it's time to bring them out, it don't have nothing to do with you. I know I've been, you've been witnessing to them over and over and over and they've been rejecting you. But your witnessing is not what causes them to be saved. One plants and one waters, but it's God that brings an increase. It's when God says it's time to come out. It's when God calls you. God says, I have called you and chosen you. You have not chosen me. And so God will reach down and he will grab your relatives. He will grab your brother. He will grab your mama. He will grab your cousin. He will grab your friend. And he begins to call them with his divine power and with his word. And God looks at you and says, do you not believe me that all things are possible to them that believe? I come to declare to you this morning that some of you have become doubters because you're looking through your own eyes. But you got to get the mind of Christ so you can look through the eyes of the Lord so someone can be saved.
God's divine word has enough power in it to fulfill what he sends it for. Whatever God says he's going to do, you have one responsibility. That's to just line up with it. Just get in line. I can't hardly stop because I have so many examples. Last example. We ain't got to look at each other. <laughs> Sitting on the pulpit. Amen. Praising the Lord. Jesus. Pastor Alexander preaching hard. Yes. Dr. Marty sitting right there. Pastor Payne on the other side. I'm praising God. Jesus. And the Lord said, tomorrow when you go to work, I'm going to elevate you on your job. Yes. I look, did you say something? <laughs> she looked at me. Praising the Lord. Tomorrow when you go to work, I'm going to elevate you on your job. Did you say what? I said, man, the Lord sure talks clear. The next day when I went to work, every person that was over me was all fired. I went in the office. The boss was like, come here, brother. come here, Hudson. He said, brother Hudson, come here, Hudson. I said, what's going on, man? Where's everybody? He said, I fired everybody. I was like, what? He said, they came in. One guy came in, brought the other ones, and they tried to do like a revolt. Right. And he said, you're all fired. Amen. He said, I need a sales supervisor. Yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> I went from being commissioned only to making 44000 a year salary plus commission and running the whole office the very next day because God said God's word has enough power in it to bring to pass whatever it is that he says he don't need you to help he don't need you to get in it he don't need you to mess it up all you gotta do is line up with his word and say God if you said it Said it, that's still God has called us in these last days to make a difference. Amen. He's called us to lay hands on the sick. He's called us to preach his word. He's called us to teach. He's called us to witness. He's called us to counsel. He's called us to write. He's called us to sing. He's called us to pray. All of these things God has called you to do. And when you step up and do what God has called you to do, then everything that God says is going to happen will happen. When you lay hands on the sick, they get healed. When you sing unto the Lord, yokes are broken. We consult with people, it says his words soothe. You write, a person is able to receive what you write, and it changes their life forever. Amen. God will accomplish what He said He's going to do. Let us stand.